It's called the abyscopal effect, which is, you know, it's amazing. The conventional systemic to tumor approach, it really damages the immune system. That, that's your body's defenses. And so what Dr. Williams and the William Cancer Institute is doing is actually using the immune system, not destroying it, but using the immune system. And guess what? Empowering it, activating it to do what it was designed to do. Seems obvious. <laughs> Seems like it should be what everybody's doing, but... It's not, but you know, fortunately, you were able to find the Williams Cancer Institute, travel down to Mexico City. Now, you had multiple treatments, correct? I'm going to pause for a moment. Sure. Listen to Jessica Para. When she tells you you need a passport, you need a passport to get into Mexico. You do not need one to get into Canada. You can use your real ID. You cannot use your real ID to get in and out of Mexico. We needed a passport for her pronto. We got it on the Friday before we flew out on the, oh, wow. the Monday. Wow. Um, when they say, do these things, if there's vitamins or protocols to follow, listen, do those vitamins, do those protocols, have your passport ready. If you don't think you have cancer, you'll probably meet somebody that does and you could help them get your passport now. <laughs> <laughs> because it was, it was, it was a little was scary. Insane. Yes. I mean, literally I am, I'm, I, I go, to, we drive all the way to Dallas to get the passport and they tell it's, me they can't give it to me because they've mailed it. And I went over and sat in a chair and just cried because I'm like, if I don't get into this treatment, I'm going to die. <laughs> uh, the immigration, <laughs> we're in the office and you're not allowed to have your cell phone. They tell me very quietly, go to the bathroom and you're allowed to use your cell phone there. So they guided me what to do. I got the name of the supervisor. He said, if you don't get her passport, you come back and see me personally. They were wonderful. And uh, we will help you. And so I went in the bathroom and I called all of the post offices and the postmasters. <laughs> and we literally got in the car and followed that, that UPS truck. You, United States Postal Truck, and we got to where it got delivered, and we went in. And got it. <laughs> and they, they knew my name, and thank God they knew my name, because when we got there, the power had gone out, and the systems were shut down, and no mail could be picked up. And I said, challenges. I said, but I spoke to so-and-so, and this is Linda Staggs, and I know you have this for her. And she goes, oh, yeah, I did speak with you. Oh, yes, we do. We already pulled it before the power went out. This well, th is Beverly this is good. Staggs. This, this is good because you were encountering obstacles, but, oh, gosh, but, but, oh. but you were believing that healing was possible. Mm -hmm. You were owning your potential healing journey, yes. but you were living it. You were not no. going to be denied. You were not going no. to be denied. And, and, and this I is important because you weren't doing it alone. Yeah. You had support. Yeah. You had support you to need, help you. You need, a, you need a helper. You do. You, you need, need a soul sister. You need, <laughs> a soul sister. You need, you know, friends and um, best friends. I've got lots of uh, best friends, childhood friends, um, and just people that, you know, support you. And um, don't give up. Yeah, just don't. do not give up. Don't take no for an answer. Yeah. And whatever it takes, if you're kind and nice and you ask for help, that supervisor you know, we had to get an appointment to get into that for that. You don't just walk into that federal building. You have to have an appointment. Yeah. And I had the supervisor's name that would get us back in the door in the event we couldn't. Get the passport. Get the passport. So, so you, you treat people with kindness and respect and gratitude because right. you never know who's going to open that door for you. And if you do that, it just comes back in so many ways. Now, you ended up having 10 treatments with Dr. Williams and Dr. Vargas and the team down in Mexico City. Now, I think this is what's important because people go, okay, 10 treatments. They, they have that picture of, you know, lying in bed, sick, you know, all of the things that come to what we think is cancer care. But your experience was quite different because it was not a systemic to tumor, but intratumoral to systemic. You not only stopped living, you began to live again is that right yeah so um yeah we so we did we did get to mexico city and 
Uh, we met the doctors in person and everybody, I just want to say, was warm and compassionate and brilliant and just intelligent, that knowledgeable. I mean, but just the, the warmth. They were so supportive. They were available. Um, Can I? But they met us and then we... Let, let me pause. Dr. Carlos Vargas came to the hotel and sat with us yes, for an did. hour. Juan and Margarita. Margarita, beautiful Hispanic lady, held the, the name up. William's the answer to drivers. William, yes. yes. So when we got there, unknown, un, cannot speak Spanish except for three words. Gracias, mucho, mucho gracias, and <laughs> mucho gracias. <laughs> Learn the gracias, it takes you a long way. So we, we, we got there and with our, Beverly sign, her name, William Cancer, we knew we had a driver mm -hmm. and they told us, you stay right there. You do not leave the airport. You wait. Directly. We will find you. We will find you. <laughs> you stay in the airport. She found us. We got guided out to a Mercedes with Juan, the driver, smiling, happy, lift all our luggage, no problem. We were guided safely yeah, we and carefully right through to the hotel, walked in and introduced to the, you know, the concierge in the hotel, make sure they, they, these ladies are taken care of. And, and then Dr. Carlos Vargas came to the hotel and said, I'm going to explain all these questions. We had a thousand questions written down. And also uh, Angie helping me Angie. get paperwork I needed for my job. I mean... You know, I wouldn't have my job if Angie hadn't been so all the paperwork. You know, uh, attentive to what I needed, and um, now, you I think know, that's so that's a, that's an important point there because you continued to work in between treatments, correct? Yeah, I did. I um, actually I had twelve treatments, but I worked through the tenth treatment. Okay. Um, did you lose your hair? Trial. No. I did not. <laughs> okay, right. So the point here is you were at a, a fixed point where you didn't see life and living as possible. You were beginning to set the stage to exit life. But then yes. once you started treatment, because I think people look at treatment, Beverly, and they think that's, you know, living is going to begin after treatment's done. But for you, it, it was actually quite different. It seems that the initiation of treatment began to restore the possibility of living in you. Yeah, so that's true. And in uh, January, actually, um, I guess that was after treatment number, I see October, November, two in December. Um, yeah, so fourth, after my fourth treatment in January, I decided I was going to start dating because <laughs> I was starting to realize that, you know, that this, <laughs> this is really possibly going to be no evidence of disease, right? So... But you know, you don't know, you don't have the PET scan yet. So So do you have a tractor? Uh, do you have a tractor? <laughs> <laughs> no tractor. <laughs> She's open to riding a horse, but no tractor. No. <laughs> so anyways, so, um, you know, and I, uh, so I started dating and actually the first date I went on, I met the most wonderful <laughs> man and we have uh, just celebrated uh, six, months six months of dating. Um, long-term relationship. Long relationship. <laughs> yeah, 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 not short-term, long-term. <laughs> long term. He's, yeah, in, he's here. He's long term. Yeah, yep. Yeah. And I, you know, but I mean, it's it's you know, it is something because I mean, you know, you go out on a date and you say, okay, you just kind of get to know each other a little bit, and then I'm thinking, well, when do you tell them that you have stage four breast cancer? And so I decided, you know, well, if I'm going to date, I think the second date would be <laughs> the, you know, before before there's too much attachment, but you've been out on one date, so you know you like them well enough for a second date, and you're kind of thinking this through. And so, you know, second date, I tell him I have stage four breast cancer. And of course he was very supportive. But um, did he, but clearly you had already undergone treatment and physically you didn't manifest what most people would see as a person undergoing stage four treatment. So here, and I'm just trying to help people understand you were having a date and dates with a man who clearly somebody that's doing conventional cancer care, chemo radiation surgery, there would be no question. They'd go, ah, some, okay, they, they don't look well, but that clearly was not the vibe that you were given off. No, no, nobody would know that I was, um, had cancer or in cancer treatment just by looking at me. Absolutely not. Or, you know, even for the most part, I kept up a pretty active, active life. 
Um, I did rest, of course, you know, during treatment and, you know, after treatment. Um, I had some recovery time, but for each treatment. But, um, you know, in between that, yes, I was, um, you know, working as much as possible and uh, full time. And, um, you know, like the, when I was home, I was working. Um, and um, well, she had one friend that was took her out, and I said, "Don't you dare get hurt by the motorcycles." I was, <laughs> I, I was the I was the big sister, where like the guys would go, "Is she allowed to do this or not that?" And I was like, "As long as she doesn't get hurt or or damaged." And when she was in the Diomed in Mexico City, that and um, she would go through a treatment. She came out of it like within hours that day. We'd be heading back to the hotel after a gluten-free pancakes, fresh squeezed of guava juice. I mean, the great. food was the food amazing. Was amazing. <laughs> yeah. Poached eggs and avocado toast. And so the food was amazing, fresh fruit and food and all of this care. And there was a point where we hadn't had a chance to really talk with Dr. Jason Williams, where he and Dr. Carlos Var Vargas were in the room. And we kind of call them by their first names now, to not being disrespectful, but Dr. Carlos. And they were in the hotel, or the the uh, Diomed Hospital, and we said, you know, there was a shift where she's gone from thinking she's dying to actually living, and it's a, it's a mindset. It, it wasn't just the physical, it's the body, the soul, the spirit. Her That whole mm. shift happened, and Dr. Williams started to talk about that as well and saying that that's what we're here for, is to give that hope and that you can have a good life. I mean, so, I did have, you know, fever and chills and, and fatigue, and um, after my intense treatment, I did take off some time from work to um, recover from fatigue, and, you know, and so, but when you think about what other people go through with chemotherapy and radiation, mine was minimal compared to that. I mean, you know, I was... We recovered in the hotel. Yeah. And that brings me to treating the Mexican people and Hispanic people with the warmth they give you if you reciprocate with them. I mean, the average is, what, 11 to $15 a day. Give them a $4 tip. Chip them as if you were in America. All of a sudden, after the second or third treatment, the, Ma the, I'm going to say her name, Maggie, our maid, is at the door. The extra towels, the face towels, all these things, extra toilet paper. Why all these things? Because the day that we get up early at 5 or 6 in the morning, we're not going to be there. So she stocks all of our room ahead of time. So we yeah. come back, the beds are pulled out and ready to go. All of the towels are laid out. Extra things because she knows the day after treatment is a rest day. We're not in the hospital. The thing we're, is, is with names, back. there's so many names. Oh. There's so many names. I mean, the hotel staff, staff. was warm. They took such good care of me, such good care of us. Um, you know, if I, if I was still, you know, a little groggy from treatment and, you know, maybe starting to have some fever and chills, they'd get the wheelchair and make sure I got to my room safely. Um, you know, I mean, they, I mean, everybody at the hotel was just amazing and they got really excited about my journey too. <laughs> so, so what you're, what you you're know, saying was, is what people's perception about going to Mexico for treatment mm -hmm. and then what your experience about going to treatment with the Williams Cancer Institute in Mexico, perception and reality for you was very different. Yes. Oh yeah. And the other thing was we, we the weren't drivers. sure how we should go shopping and different things. So the concierge said, ask one of the drivers, what's wonderful about getting a driver from the hotel, two things. You can ask for one that speaks English, or you can use your Google Translate, which we did for many things. But they're tracked on their phone exactly where they are when you're in the car with them. So the hotel has a vested interest in your safety. They want you to have a good, safe experience. So those drivers work through the hotel. So they know where their drivers are, but they know where their clients are. That's us. They know exactly where we are. That cell phone goes with him as we go through the grocery store. Um, we had the same driver. He knew our shopping list better than we did. <laughs> <laughs> we, we would stock up on groceries in the room. And, and really, these and, be, all of these people became family to became us. Family. Whether it was at the hospital with uh, uh, with Williams Cancer Institute, the nurses, um, the nurses, all the hospital staff, the doctors, um, the doctors. I mean, like. They were just, everybody was amazing. And, and you know, and then the, the, like I said, the hotel staff, the drivers there, I mean, 
I call all these people now my Mexico family. <laughs> so when you talk about support, my support was largely there. We had Mexico for support. We had Mexico for support. <laughs> <laughs> and I tell you what, I, I was afraid of the immigration because we don't know English really well. We got through there. And as, it, as luck has it, they decided to draw her name for a pat down. And so I very nicely spoke into the phone and said, you can pat her down, but you better be very careful. <laughs> she has stage four cancer. If you do anything to hurt her, I will just be devastated. And they looked at that, and the gentleman's eyes went big. Both of y'all just go. <laughs> and he called the supervisor over, and he said, repeat. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I made, no, no, your phone. I took the phone and held it to the supervisor, and he went, oh, you go. They were Both so Both of you go. People just go. So we, we, we don't want to. No problema. No problem. Just go. They, they wanted us to be treated with respect and kindness, they, and we don't do all of the x-rays because she has enough of that. So the pat-downs are ever, no, don't touch this, that. Even in Spanish, they translated to bring a woman over to make sure each time we went in and out that we were cared for as, as immigration patients. Mm -hmm. We were given such respect. So let me, let me fast forward here then to the watershed <laughs> moment of May 29th. 2024. And I'm going to read this to you. And then I want you to express you know, what, what it means to you. And now this is the summary of the PET CT scan. Okay. It, it read as, as such, no metabolically active bone or liver metastatic disease. Previously noted discrete lymph nodes within the right axillary region, no longer apparent. Interval resolution of infiltrative changes within the right breast, as well as resolution of previously noted increased metabolic disease. Take home. They saw nothing. What? <laughs> no evidence. What, of yeah, no evidence of disease. What does that yeah. describe the emotion when Dr. Vargas wow. reviewed that with you? Dr. Williams reviewed that with you. Well, we had a bunch of us on the phone together, really. And, um, <laughs> It was just a miracle. It felt like a miracle. As I've told them, there's there's no words that can possibly describe that experience. There are no words that can possibly describe it. You're being given something that you thought you had before, but like this time you really appreciate it and I'm not saying I didn't appreciate things before but it definitely creates a greater amount of appreciation and definitely a desire to pay it forward pay it forward and to live your very very best life and it gives hope for others to never give up. I tell everybody, Search. like, it doesn't matter if I'm standing in the line at the grocery store now. I tell somebody, I had stage four breast cancer, Williams Cancer Institute, going through the airport. Every We're going for cancer treatment, Williams Cancer Institute. And I mean, like, I tell everybody because... Either they've had it, their mother's had it, they Somebody's know had it. within three people of their lives has it or is going through it. We, we, we gave out the lady at the counter at the American Airlines. Mm -hmm. She wanted to know she was going through it. Yeah. And so the little joke is, you know, when you're standing in line and you're real tired and you're, you're getting mad at the person checking all your luggage, well, you know, it's like the airline person is standing there smiling and smiling and the guy's screaming at her. And the next you come to the counter and go, why are you smiling? And she says, oh, well, he's going to Detroit, but his luggage is going to Bangkok. <laughs> <laughs> that didn't really happen. <laughs> it didn't really happen. <laughs> you never know when you can uplift be careful. someone else. Yeah, be careful who you tick off at the airport. They may just <laughs> intentionally send your luggage somewhere else. <laughs> so you know, this is this is what I love about mm -hmm. your story. First of all, he, sharing 
these stories are, they make what we do, why we do what we do. But your story is, is much more unique because you were living. You then planned to not live. And now you lived as you went through treatment and the treatment began to propagate the idea that you can live. So your living started it while you were treating. It didn't wait till after treatment. Your relationship now six months, or at least at one point, it, it began during treatment. And now, <laughs> yes. so now the plan is to live, right? Yeah, it is. And you start making long-term plans again. And all your friends start asking you if you want your stuff back. <laughs> yeah, we're bringing things back. Oh, we you have get, a couple you get of little things. gifts like this. Cancer picked the wrong beep, girl. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and you buy shirts that say, uh, it celebrates the Mexican culture of the Day of the Dead. And it says, uh, what does not kill me? It makes me stronger, Mexico <laughs> City. <laughs> You have your friendship bracelets right, yeah. and, um, you know, from all your different friends and you just be really thankful for every single day and every single moment. I mean, really, it is about celebrating the people around you and celebrating every day. It, it is when you transformational. Said, transformational. transformational. And then when someone says, what did you do? I said, well, for the last year and then the last eight months. You know, my soul sister went through metastatic stage four cancer and they go, oh, I'm so sorry. And you pause and you go, no, she's no evidence of disease. It's eight months of treatment. And, and that's, that's why. Yeah. And, and, and I didn't have, and I still have my breast yeah. and I still have you my still, hair. You still have your, yeah. It's not that you've grown new hair, right? I mean, you still no. have your original <laughs> hair. Well, that's right. This is her, <laughs> this is me. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and, and Linda, you touched on hope because, and, and that this is what I want to close on, because I think this is where you have the opportunity to have a generational impact, an impact that, that's legacy, that is a legacy builder, that obviously there was a point where you didn't believe it, but there was a point where you started to believe it. Then you embodied it, you embraced it, you owned it, you lived it, and that's what you've just described through this wonderful and beautiful story of, of healing. But now... What would you say to those that have no hope, that, that have just been diagnosed? Because your story has the opportunity to duplicate your story, hope. What would you say? Okay, what I would say is this. We know if you do the traditional treatment, we know what that brings. We know the results of that. There's very little hope to have no evidence of disease in eight months. I know that if you give yourself a chance to have a consultation with Dr. Jason Williams, if you take that strength, I did the research, it was Beverly's courage to do it, that to give yourself that chance to know there are other avenues. It was courageous in 1885 to treat pneumonia with oxygen. This is something courageous too, it's something that we're not familiar with, it's not mainstream. Once it becomes that, it will be, that's what you do. But until that time, you have to be strong to at least allow yourself the courage to try something different, to give yourself that hope. And with this treatment, it's so directly into one area where they basically treated Beverly the entire time was in her breast with what they call a perquito, that's my favorite word, perquito band-aid, this big around, <laughs> the, you show them. <laughs> where the treatment was. Give yourself that chance. If, the, if you go through the whole Williams cancer treatment, and God forbid you say, hey, at the end of it, I want to do traditional treatment, you won't need it <laughs> because you've already been cured, but give yourself this opportunity to do something different, to research this possibility of living. Because if you don't, you're just buying into the fear and the, the, the feeling of rushed. If you don't rush, you're going to die. If you don't this, you're gonna die. It's like, no, pause for a minute. There's other ways to do things. 
You know, we used to have a cars without air conditioning. We used to didn't have seat belts. We didn't used to treat oxygen to patients. We've come so far in so many ways. This is perhaps new, but in many ways it's not. This has been um, worked on with Dr. Jason Williams Cancer Institute for years. He's been researching this. This isn't really new. It may be new to us. It may be new to our thinking that we haven't heard of all this. Um, get the book. I mean, I'm serious. You can call the institute and get it, or you can go onto Amazon and and get the book. Okay. They have it through the website. Start, now, start reading the book. Now you Just, mentioned you, you both. Yeah, you both mentioned courage and and courageous, and th there's that saying that courage is contagious, but I would say <laughs> actually, hope is contagious because hope builds courage. And so I want to leave the final words for you, Beverly. You know, is hope contagious? And how can others who are sitting there hearing this for the first time, and maybe they've heard that word cancer for the first time, maybe they've heard that they have cancer that has spread to liver and that has spread to bone and that the only thing to treat it is to cut everything out, cut everything off, radiate everything, you know, do systemic chemo. What would you say to them to give them hope to actually make that contagious? So, you know, as a mental health counselor, I have always thought of as part of my job being the ability to instill hope. <laughs> and, <laughs> you know, and, and often in life and death situations. So I feel like I should be really good at this but <laughs> you are you you are the hope but you are it, the hope this girl. is this is a this is where the facts speak for themselves i yeah. you know had metastatic breast cancer stage 4 breast cancer and i now have no evidence of disease and the facts speak for themselves i mean and, and I'm so glad that I listened to her and, and, and did the consultation with Dr. Williams. <laughs> get a passport. Get the passport. It. Get the book. Get, get, get the, the consultation. consultation. And get on your journey. <laughs> get on your journey. Of living. <laughs> well, Beverly, Linda, thank you for sharing your story. It's truly inspirational. I do believe that when people are blessed with healing like you were, Hope is not meant to be confined and contained. It's meant to be shared. And your, your willingness to share your personal journey, your personal story, I think allows others to tap into that hope and help them to be courageous, <laughs> as you mentioned, Linda. And it, your ability to share this story is going to give hope to other people, which were there who were there when you were there at one point and they can turn around and share that and build a legacy of hope. So I always end it this way with the phrase that it's hoping it forward and you are going to change people's lives by your journey as difficult as it was, but your hope, your courage is going to be passed on and they will in turn pass that on. So <laughs> thank you for sharing your story, because I know it takes a lot of, um, it takes a lot to share such a personal story. Thank you. Thank you both. Thank you. Thank you, Kent Williams Cancer Institute Thank for you. saving her life. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, God. Thanks, God.